I want to start with a couple of questions this morning. It's not a quiz. I'm not going to come around and check answers. Don't worry about it. But I want us to take a moment and give some thought to two very important questions. First question, how would you like to have more of an experience of God in your daily life? What specifically would that look like? Think about it for a moment in very concrete terms. Would you like God to be more involved in your relationships with your family, with your friends? Would you like God to be more involved in decisions you make about the way you spend your time or maybe the way you spend your money? Would you like to have more of a sense of how God is present and active in the world today? Do you really want God to be more a part of your life? And if so, where or how would you like God's presence to be manifest? That's the first question. Second question, you can see this coming. <laughs> what changes would you be willing to make in order to invite God into your life in a more intimate and more meaningful way? Would you be willing to change the way that you interact with your family and your friends? Would you be willing to change the way you spend your time or the way you spend your money? Would you be willing to change the way you think about what it is you see going on in the world today? You can see the challenge here. If our answer to the first question is yes, absolutely, I would like God to be more present and more active in my life, but our answer to the second question is I'm not sure I'm ready to make significant changes to my life, then we need to revisit our answer to the first question. If we say we want God's presence in our lives, but we are not ready to make changes, then maybe we don't really want God to be more present and active in our life. And there is, of course, an even more uncomfortable third question just waiting in the wings here. If we discern that we don't want God to be any more present and active in our lives than he already is, then why are we here? Is the way that we pursue the life of faith actually designed to keep God at a distance? Now, what do these questions have to do with our gospel lesson? Just this. The conversation between Jesus and his disciples is all about God's presence and God's activity in their lives. And the good news is that Jesus gives his disciples a promise that God is already more present and more active in their lives than they think he is. Beyond their wildest hopes and dreams, God has promised that he will be with them and will shape and direct their lives in ways that they can't even begin to imagine. And Jesus makes that same promise to us. Jesus makes that same promise to you. If we are ready to let him have his way with us, he is more than ready to be present and active in our lives. Now, in order to recognize the way in which this question bears on our gospel lesson, we have to get something out of the way first. I'm going to say something now that may surprise some of you, may even disappoint some of you. But there is something here we need to get out of our way. Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. What does that verse mean? What is that verse about? Here is the surprise. That passage and indeed this entire section of John's gospel is not about going to heaven after we die. And I will be the first to admit that some passages in this story seem to lend themselves to that interpretation. Indeed, our own prayer book is a little guilty of this. <laughs> this is one of several texts that is recommended for funerals and burials. I am going away and I will take you to myself. Sounds wonderful. But if we look at this story more closely, we see it actually has very little to do with going to heaven after we die. In fact, the whole question of what happens to us after we die does not even come up in this part of John's gospel. It is not the issue. <laughs> the real issue throughout this section of John's gospel has to do with the relationship between Jesus and his disciples in the present, in their lives, 
not in the future. Jesus knows he is about to be arrested and handed over to the Romans. He is preparing them for his departure. But what he has to say to them surprises them because he doesn't say, it's been nice to know you, I'm going away, here's what to do after I'm gone. It's not what he says. Instead, he says, because you have known me, you have known my father. And the fact that I'm leaving doesn't change that one bit. In fact, I am going to the father and I am taking you with me. And those who abide in me will continue to do my father's work just as I have done my father's work. And those who do my father's work will know my father and my father will know them and we will come to them and we will make our home with them. The relationship that Jesus shares with his disciples is not over. In fact, his relationship with them was about to get closer and stronger than it had ever been. Up to this point, they had enjoyed a special intimacy with God because of the presence of Jesus. And now, just because he was about to be taken from them, it did not mean that their relationship with God was going to be in any way diminished. In fact, it was going to get even more intense than it already was. So being with Jesus, being where Jesus is with the Father, does not mean that we have to die and go to heaven to get there. What Jesus promises to his disciples is that he is going to the Father and he is taking them with him now while they are still alive. And because they will be with him where he is with the Father, they will be with the Father. And because they will be with him, they will be able to do the work that he gives them to do. And in fact, they will do even greater works than those done by Jesus. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is about a lot more than what happens to us after we die. This is about the presence and the activity of God in our lives here and now. Okay, that sounds great. God, I could really use a new car. <laughs> I could really use a new job. I could really use a new house. I'd really like to see an end to war and violence. Would be great if you could wipe out world hunger. And while you're at it, please do something about my teenager. In the name of Jesus, amen. That's not what we're talking about either. <laughs> we're not talking about going to heaven after we die, and we're not talking about magic. Learning to pray in the way that Jesus tells us that we can pray means learning to live the way that he lived in relationship with the Father. And throughout John's gospel, Jesus constantly says things like that. The words I speak to you are not my words. They are my Father's words. The works you see me doing are not my works. They are my Father's works. Jesus was so firmly grounded in the will and the love of his Father that he knew his Father would do anything he asked of him because he only did things that were consistent with his Father's will. And there's an especially striking example of this towards the end of John's gospel, right before John's account of the Last Supper. You'll remember, John's account of the Last Supper is quite different from the one that we get in the other three gospels, right? In John, right before the Last Supper, John writes what I think is his version of the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And just like John's account of the Last Supper, it is rather different than the version that we get in the other Gospels. When we think of Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, what do we think of? What image comes to mind? Jesus agonizing over what is about to happen to him. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Jesus asks his father for something and his father doesn't do it. So Jesus submits, not my will, but your will be done. John gives us something quite different. When Jesus knows that his hour had come, what does he say in John? Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. So how does he pray in John? Father, glorify your name. And his father answers, I have glorified it and I will glorify it. His father does exactly what he asks. 
Now, I'm not trying to suggest that John gives us a picture of Jesus who is more obedient than the image we get in the other Gospels. What I'm trying to suggest is that John consistently gives us a picture of Jesus who is so connected to the life and the love of his Father, so grounded and dedicated to his, father will, his Father's will, that even at the moment when their relationship is about to be tested to the uttermost, Jesus can confidently pray, okay, here goes. Looks like we're going to do this thing. Father, glorify your name. And the Father faithfully responds, I am with you. I will glorify my name. So the question before us is, how do we do that? <laughs> how do we learn to pray like that? How do we learn to live like that? One of the clearest and most concise answers to that question that I have run across was provided by a woman named Clara Schlink. Clara was a woman who founded a religious order in Germany not long after the end of World War II. Keep that in mind, after World War II in Germany. One of the things that Clara taught the members of her order how to do is to pray like Jesus. And she said, when you are happy, say, yes, Father. When you are sad, say, yes, Father. And when you are suffering, say, yes, Father. And when you pray like that, strength will flow into your heart. That is how we learn to pray like Jesus. Now that may sound like a recipe for disaster. That may sound as if what we're being asked to do is to just accept whatever comes our way, grin and bear it, and then hopefully someday God will reward us for being good little soldiers. But I don't think that's what learning to pray in that way is really about. Learning to pray like that, learning to say, Father, glorify your name, or even just to say, yes, Father. Learning to pray like that means learning to abide in the will and the love of the Father. It means learning to let God have his way with us in the midst of whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. Because make no mistake, what Jesus tells us today is that God is always more ready to be present and active in our lives than we are willing to let him. God always has more for us than we are willing to ask or even imagine. Learning to pray like Jesus means allowing God to show us what he has in mind for our lives rather than us telling him what we have in mind for our lives. When we learn to pray the way that Jesus himself prayed, then we will find ourselves naturally doing the works that Jesus himself did. And in fact, we may even find ourselves doing greater works than these. Because whatever we ask in his name, whatever is consistent with his will, he will do it. And when that happens, everybody wins. The Father is glorified in the Son. The Son is glorified in us and we are glorified in God. So that's what's going on in our gospel lesson today. Jesus is making a promise to all those who would call themselves his disciples. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, and if you believe in me, if you abide in me, I will do whatever you ask. So receive the promise that God makes to you today. Our risen Lord has gone ahead of us to the Father and has taken us with him. Even now, we are where he is and he is where we are. He is the way and the truth and the life. And now that he has found us, we can find our way to the one who is the source of all truth and all life. So pray believing that he is in you and you are in him. Pray, Father, glorify your name and you will find him answering you. I have and I will, good and faithful servant. Amen.